Welcome to Weaving the Blanket, the Aguayu, stories of faith, sacrifice, martyrdom, and the emancipation of the Evangelical Methodist Church in Bolivia. My name is David Stevenson. This is Season 4, The Making of the Saints of the IMB, and this is Episode 4, Benho's Conversion. In the last episode, we heard of Benjamin Paredes, better known as Benho, and his conversion to Methodist Christianity and the incredible development work that Benho and the Corsons did in Sepecho in just two years. They completed both a fish project and a brick project. Sarah emailed me an incredible story, which I didn't get from her when I was recording our phone call. It's a story of just one Methodist family and what it meant for them to follow God and be his servant. It's an incredible story. Sarah said that one morning when they were in Sepecho, a teenage boy stood back away from the front door until I noticed him. And then respectfully he said, Good morning, Senora. I recognized him as being a teenager who had asked permission to build a shelter in which to live with at the side of the fish ponds. He would be working in the lot near us making bricks. Ken had told me that his parents were dead and that he was taking care of his younger brother and sister. Come in, I said, and I motioned him to a chair at the table. I sat down near to him to get acquainted. You are Florencio, aren't you? Mm, hi, Senora, he answered hesitantly after a long pause. Finally, he stated the purpose of his visit. I am worried about my kids, Senora. They have lice in their hair. Do you have any medicine that will kill lice? I need to buy some, but there's none available here in Sepecho. Now, someone in Alabama had given us a medicated shampoo, so I went with Florencio across the fish ponds to help him treat his seven-year-old brother and his 10-year-old sister. His, quote, house, unquote, was built of a few pieces of metal roofing with the ground floor floor and tall grasses tied together for walls. Inside, he had driven a post into the ground and tied saplings to it from two walls, making a platform that filled a corner of the room. Over this, he had spread a blanket, making a bed for the three of them. I noticed three bowls, three cups, and three spoons on the dirt floor in another corner of the room, along with a blackened cooking pot. Outside the hut was their, quote, stove, unquote. Ashes among three big rocks outside their door showed me where they cooked. On the opposite wall, a big bunch of cooking bananas lay by a basket of grapefruit. A few clothes were hanging over a bamboo cane that extended from the wall to wall overhead. It was a home that spoke silently and sharply of their poverty, yet it contained all the necessary items for survival. Hanging by a vine wrapped around a bamboo cane was a nice suitcase of cowhide like those you see in the big cities. The suitcase was a clue that these children had once lived in a much better circumstance. Little by little, as we became better acquainted with Florencio his sister Juanita, and his little brother Lucio, we learned their story. His father had been a prosperous farmer in another section of Bolivia. They had many fruit trees, sheep, and cattle. But by the time Florencio was 12 years old, both of his parents were dead. And the relatives began to fight over his father's property. At that early age, 12 years old, Florencio assumed the responsibilities of being the head of the home. He worked the fields as he had helped his father do before, but when his harvest was ready, the relatives stopped by and demanded a percent of his harvest. They took so much that he didn't have enough to feed little Lucio and Juanita. Florencio was so hurt with all this arguing and fussing and found no peace among his own people in his own town. So he packed the bare essentials in his father's good suitcase, took his brother and sister, and started out across Bolivia to find a place where he could live in peace. 
For five years, Florencio had wandered over the country, working at any job that presented itself. Being a hard worker, he found that he could make enough to feed his little family, even though he was only a boy. One day he heard about the Alta Bene, where one could homestead their own farm. So he signed up for a farm, but there was a long waiting list. But he wanted to live in a place like Sapecho, so that once the farm became available, he would be ready to farm it when his time came. So that's why he was living there in Sapecho at the time, waiting to get his land assigned to him. From the beginning, we had been impressed with Florencio's willingness to work. Every morning when we got up at the first light of dawn, we'd look across the finch ponds and we'd see that all three of the children were already busy carrying water or mixing mud to make more bricks. We invited them to Sunday school and church and they came. One day, about three weeks after they had moved in to the little hut on our ponds, Florencio stood at the door again. He came in and sat down at the table as before. Signora, he said again in a serious tone, there is something else I need that I cannot buy in Sepecho. I wonder if you could help me again this time. I'm ashamed to tell you, Signora, but I don't have a Bible. We never went to church before we came here. I still don't know much about God since I've only been to church three times now, but I feel like I've been raising my kids just like animals. I need a Bible to find out more about God and to teach my kids. Do you have a Bible to sell? Well, of course, we found a Spanish Bible for him. One of our church leaders, Crisologo Apaza, came in while we were talking, and he showed Florencio the different books of the Bible, and the teenager soaked up every word. As Crisologo and I talked with him, explaining the message of Jesus, tears began to run down his face of his strong and independent 17-year-old. He brushed the tears off and said in a choked voice, struggling to control his motions. When I was younger, I thought of God a lot, but then I had a lot of trouble and I got, I, and got so upset inside with all the arguing and the fighting, I just forgot about God. That's why I gave my uncles a farm and left. I wanted to find peace, but I've never really found it. I've never really known how to give my life to God. That's why I wanted a Bible. Well, sitting at our table that afternoon, Florencio committed his life to Jesus Christ. Tears ran down his cheeks as he said, The peace I've been seeking is not found in our surroundings, is it? God gives it to us inside, despite our outside problems. Several weeks later, Florencio was elected secretary of the church's youth group, for the entire Alta Bene district. Afterward, he came to us a little shaky and he said, please, will you help me? He pleaded. I don't know much yet. I'm just beginning. But with such a beginning, there is always the possibility of a great ending. A few months later, we had to spend a week in the capital. And we came home to Sepecho to find the little 10-year-old Juanita taking care of a child who looked to be less than two years old. When we asked her who he was, she replied, we don't know. His parents came through Sepecho walking in the rain and asked if they could spend the night in the church building. They were sick and coughing so hard that night they could hardly breathe. They said they were trying to get to some relative's homestead further in the jungle. So we gave them some rice to eat and, let, and lent them a dry blanket from our house, but the next morning, we found them lying there, dead in the church. Does anybody know who their relatives are, I asked? No, Hermana, we didn't ask their names. No one has ever seen them before. And the little boy can't talk enough to tell us anything. The Hermanos of the church came together to bury the mother and the father and then tried to decide who would take the child to raise them. But no one had any extra food for another person, she continued. 
They were afraid they might not be able to take care of their own children if they added another mouth to feed. But me and Florencio and Lucio, we don't have little kids. Florencio decided he could get enough food to feed the three of us and the little boy. So I offered to take care of him. They were really just kids themselves. Florencio was 17, his sister probably around 14, and his younger brother maybe 10 or 11. Now together, these three orphan children decided it was their responsibility to take in this other little orphan child. They said, the hermanos from the church helped us get a few more clothes for the little boy, Juanita explained. And they told us that they would share their food when they had any extra. And we can make it fine. We have a big family here in the church to help out. This is not the only family in the Alta Bini where children are raising children because their parents have died. Some years after Sarah had returned back to the United States, she got word that Flincio had finally gotten his own homestead but no one has actually talked with them because they had to move much further into the jungle to get this land. But the last they knew, everyone was doing right. It's just a story of just one other IEMB member making a sacrifice to serve God. By the end of the Corson's two years there, the tilapia ponds were full and provided more fingerlings than were needed to stock all the homesteaders' ponds. Farmers came from other parts of Bolivia to get fingerlings too, and even one man came from Peru to get a start on the tilapia ponds. They multiply rapidly. There was still a surplus, which they let grow, and people came regularly to buy fish to eat. Kim wrote a grant proposal to UNICEF, who provided the pipes for the community to bring in clean water to the village from high in the mountains nearby. Today, the architecture has change as many bamboo homes have been replaced with brick homes, which Habitat helped them build with the bricks that the orphan boy taught the people to make for themselves. And while we might still think they are poor, they don't think so, as their basic needs are met and hunger has vanished from the town. The Corsons returned to the U.S. at the end of those two years, but continued to be involved in Sepecho. They started, as I said earlier, CFAP, Servants in Faith and Technology in Wewoke, Alabama, where they trained local town leaders from across the globe on how to work and develop their community and provide a better life for their citizens. And they also educate North Americans about the roots of poverty, both overseas and in the United States. There's more on CFAT at the website of this podcast. Meanwhile, Benho continued to be a leader of the community. He organized community to bring irrigation, electricity, and a better life, and he actually became the appointed lay Methodist pastor for Sepecho, preaching each week at the church he once so despised. The Corsons obviously stayed in touch with Benho and provided him support when they could. In 1980, Benho, the Corsons, and CFAT participated in a global research project of Rodale Press and Organic Farms to find out which variety of amaranth produced better in the different climates of the world. Amaranth is a grain that is high in protein that the Mayan Indians used to use until the conquistadors and Catholic priests destroyed it because the Mayans called it the food of the gods and used it in their religious sacrifices. It has more protein in it than other grains so that those who ate it were much healthier than the average person and is known today as a food that helps in malnutrition. At the end of the research, Rodale Press stated that the results of the experiment directed by Ben Ho at Sepecho gave them the best information of any of the experiments carried out throughout the world in a number of countries. Sarah took the seed of five different varieties of amaranth provided by Rodale Press and formed a team in the summer of 1980 of 17 people to go back to Sepecho to specifically help Ben Ho and his team 
from Sapecho to do this project. But Ken had already committed to go to Haiti that summer. And there was a mission down there that was going to get thrown out if they didn't start some technology project to help the people. The church was just preaching, so they called Ken to come and help them do something for the poor. And they said, we know theology, but we don't know anything about technology. So the Corsons in the summer of 1980 split up. Chris, their oldest child now, was 20 years old, and he stayed in Wawoki to run CFAT. Ken took their youngest daughter with him to Haiti, and this coincided with Sarah taking the middle two kids, Tom and Kathy, along with 15 others on a team to Sepecho for a week. The team was going to work with the Sepecho locals to develop these fields. The team was made up mostly of college kids and a few adults. There were two adult nurses, two men in their 50s who were paramedics, and one older woman who had gray hair. Fifteen and the two children. The plan was then for the family to reunite at Grandma's house in Miami before traveling back to Alabama. When the team got to Sepecho, they discovered that a family who worked for a European development agency had moved into town. The father's name was Adrian. What the agency didn't know was that Adrian was a communist who wanted to develop the Communist Party in Sepecho. But he also did a lot of development work and helped with the education of the local teachers. Adrian tried to convince Ben Ho to return to the Communist Party, but there was no way Ben Ho was going to leave his beliefs in God and Jesus Christ. At the meetings, Adrian would talk about how terrible the Americans were and, and how they were imperialists. Sarah decided she was going to go talk to this guy because he was in development, Sarah was in development, they were in the same town, and they needed to be able to talk to each other. The team members strongly opposed this plan. Don't talk to him. He's a communist. You're going to get us all killed. But she went anyway. The conversation was polite, and eventually they agreed that they had the same goals, but just had different strategies about how to help the poor. But Sarah made it clear that she believed in nonviolence. Andrian said that Jesus had died 2,000 years ago and his methods had failed many, many times. But at least they parted on a friendly basis. Little did they know that that conversation was probably what saved the lives of six men on that CFAT team. So on Wednesday night, July 16, 1980, Ken and Karen are in Haiti. Sarah, Tom, Kathy, along with a U.S. team, are resting and sleeping at their old brick home, preparing to work on the new gardens for the Amaranth. And Ben Ho, the mayor and local Methodist pastor, was preparing his sermon for that regular Thursday night worship service. And then the calendar changed to July 17, 1980, and all hell broke loose. We will have a few more episodes before we get to July 17th, so I can tell you about two more Bolivian Methodists whose lives will, on that day, intertwine with Ben Ho and Sarah Corson. CFAT has now published Ben Ho's life story in a book. He wrote this book in the little house in the jungle near Sepecho. He sent it to La Paz for a CFAT worker there to type it into the computer and then send it on up to the Corsons by computer. Next week, we will hear the story of Eugenio Poma, a child living in extreme poverty, indentured servant of the Altiplano, a peon, 
educated by the church in both Bolivia and the United States, becomes a bishop of the IMB. Then after his term is up, he becomes the Bolivian ambassador to Denmark and later the spokesman for the indigenous people around the world at the World Council of Churches in Switzerland. And we will find out where he was on July 17, 1980. See you next week.